Welcome to the CEO of Destiny podcast, where you will find the tools to fulfill the purpose of your generation and wildly succeed in the marketplace. And now your host, Andre J. Benjamin. Greetings, greetings. Welcome to the CEO of Destiny show. I am your host, Andre J. Benjamin, and I am delighted and excited to have with us our guest today. We have our guest, Miss Tina Hollenbeck, and she is the author of Eight Great Smarts for Homeschoolers. And this book caught my attention because um, like many parents throughout the United States and probably other nations, I don't know where you're watching or listening from, uh, people had to make adjustments in the last couple of years with how they were uh, educating or schooling their children. And um, my wife and I had to kind of make a hybrid type situation where, you know, some were uh, you know, one of our children was still going to the classroom. Another one was doing having a private instructor work with them consistently daily, uh, you know, a maximum amount of time. And then I was tasked and privileged with the opportunity myself to work with one of our children day to day. And I say the challenge and the opportunity because you get to work in close and personal with your child. And uh, the reason why I invited Miss Tina on was to get insight from someone who has spent a great amount of time even developing, uh, we'll talk about the homeschool resource um, center uh, in a minute, but I really wanted someone who is passionate about this and who, re who really has created tools for parents to be able to access how to become confident that they're capable in, in unplugging the capabilities or unlocking the cap capabilities of their children. So welcome, Tina. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm really glad that we're connecting here. Absolutely. So um, I'm. I grew up as a a, a, a big fan of comic books. Um, I spent a lot of time comic comic book stores, going to the latest, seeing which one dropped, which one came out. Me and my best friend would always go, you know, scour throughout the city and throughout the neighborhood looking for comic books. So there was Marvel, there's DC, and the emergence of other comic universes like the Unique Universe. Um, a gentleman out of Africa built a, a comic book company. And I, no matter what, I've always been interested in origin stories. So can you tell us a little bit about your origin story and where you hail from and kind of you know, just a little bit about you so that our audience knows. That was a neat segue. <laughs> um, so I am in uh, Wisconsin, born and raised in Wisconsin. Um, I am currently in the Green Bay area, so Northeast Wisconsin. I came up here for college, uh, met my Packers, husband huh? on campus and never <laughs> left. <laughs> um, so we've been up here the whole entire time. Um, got a degree from the university here in Green Bay. Um, it was a humanities degree, so you can't do anything with that. But at the time, uh, my pastor at my church said, hey, I'm your secretary, you need a job. How about you do that? <laughs> so I did for a couple of years and then God called me to go back for my, my teaching license. And I ended up teaching English to immigrant kids for nine years before my children were born. Wow. Um, I taught five years at a middle school, four years at a high school. And uh, then my older daughter was born and my husband and I knew that for sure I would come home and be an at-home mom as soon as we were blessed with children and assumed that we would homeschool. Um, he wasn't quite on board with that. He was a little concerned that his parents would be upset because they're public school teachers. And uh, he is the firstborn good boy. So he was a little bit worried about that, but, but not opposed, just we didn't know. Concerned. Um, and, yeah. And then my younger daughter was born 11 and a half months after my older. So I was raising almost twins. Wow. <laughs> And uh, never did go back to the classroom because um, my husband was a youth pastor for a little while at that time. And so he got to know all the kids in our youth group, no matter where they went to school. And he came home one day when my girls were just little and he said, um, you know, I like, I like all the kids in the youth group. Well, no, I like most of the kids in the youth group, <laughs> um, so but there's know. something different about those homeschooled kids. They, what he noticed again, just as an observer was that they were more social than all the other kids. Um, they could talk to everybody and they didn't have the clicks and they didn't have the insecurities and they had more interest. And he said, if that's what homeschooling does, then I'm all in. And we'll talk to my parents, we'll figure it out. And they were phenomenal. Um, my in-laws are great. They just, uh, they've always modeled for me. We raised our kids, 
as long as you're not harming them, you can raise your kids and use that grace and that blessing. And, um, and so they, they were fine. Uh, and it was actually such a neat blessing to have them alongside us when we homeschooled. So, um, and now just like that, I blinked my eyes and my girls are adults. Wow. <laughs> our, our older one is 21. Um, she is, uh, our church secretary, the very same job I had, uh, before I went into teaching and she still lives with us. Uh, and my younger daughter is 20 and she's married and she just announced, um, two days ago, three days ago that she is expecting our first grandchild. Wow. So Congratulations. We are just, so now it repeats. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell, tell us, us a little bit about your own personal schooling background. What was your schooling background? Like meaning in the sense of, did you go to a public school? Did, were you homeschooled as a child? Or did you go to private charter? Um, you know, what is the uh, Montessori? What, yep. Or were you unschooled even? That's the- <laughs> <laughs> I wish. You know, um, my parents didn't know anything about homeschooling. And I'm old enough that... Um, Homeschooling became legal in Wisconsin the year I graduated from high school. So anybody who knows when Wisconsin did that, you can know my age. I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) Uh, I don't don't know that my parents would have done it anyway. And um, difficult family situation. So it was probably better that they didn't. Um, So I was born and raised in Milwaukee County until I was 11. So I went to a suburban Milwaukee elementary school. And then when we were, when I was 11, my family moved out to the country. So I actually went to a very small um, public school for middle school and high school. Uh, My graduating class had 42 kids and that was the big class. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So it, it certainly wasn't like homeschooling or a private school, but it was, it was kind of close in the sense that it was a small school. It was a little town. Everybody knew everybody, good, bad, and otherwise. (laughs) Um, And I got a lot of personal attention. And so um, sometimes I'm I'm in touch with a couple of those teachers and sometimes they get their feathers ruffled a little bit because I strongly advocate for homeschooling now. And they, they say, you know, we're so sorry. We didn't do right by you. And I said, no, you guys did. You did well in a little school. I think it, it's it's easier to get involved, and and then they were. So I don't ever uh, bash them. In fact, they don't bash teachers at all because oh. my problem with the public school system is not the teachers who care. It's the the nature of the system itself. So. Um, So yeah, but as soon as I heard about homeschooling uh, as a young adult, um, and I wasn't a Christian growing up either, and I became a Christian when I was a college freshman, and that changed my perspective as well. So so it seems from what you're saying that your story began with the work with your own children. How did it expand into helping other parents? What brought the desire for you to reach out to other parents? Because yes, um, a good amount of parents can say that once the first, all of them can say that once know, my wife and I uh, had some friends who were married before us and they told us about, you know, we had our first child, then we had our second child and we have three. And they said, you know, we, when it gets to the third child, they said, now you're going from uh, man to man to zone. You're outnumbered now. <laughs> so they were saying, they were saying you got to you gotta deploy a different set of skills and tactics. So what what made you, uh, it, it seems like a natural progression to, you know, look at your own children, but then what made you look at other parents and, and think of how, how you could start being, a, you know, not a play on words, but a resource? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, what's kind of funny. I can actually credit Common Core for that. <laughs> hey, absolutely. Uh, I'm not a fan of Common Core, but... Um, so just having been a public school teacher and still having friends who were teaching when the common core standards came about, uh, in public schools, which was 2009, 2010. So that, yeah, my girls were like eight, nine, 10 years old at that point. Um, I was aware of it. Um, I was aware that they weren't real happy that they had to start using those standards in the schools. And I started looking into it. I'm like, what is that? And then as a taxpayer, I thought, I'm not really happy about this, but I remember thinking in about 2010, well, at least I can do what I'm doing with homeschooling. I certainly can advocate as a taxpayer or a citizen, but, but I'm going to keep doing what I do. And then in 2013, one of the big name homeschool companies um, did a revision on their curriculum. And I had used their curriculum. I had just switched away from it, but I had used it for years. So I got their email blast and it said, good news, we're aligned with Common Core now that we've made our revision. <laughs> Oh, joy. And I know. And I, and that same week, another big name homeschool company came out and said, you know what, we'll look at the common core standards and we'll use them if we feel like they're useful. And I was like, oh no. Wow. And I wasn't the only one. 
I was in some Facebook groups for homeschoolers and that lit up those groups because first of all, parents didn't really know what it was. Absolutely. And those of them who, who knew what it was were none too happy about it. And, um, but then with lots of discussions, right? And lots of people saying, well, you know, what is Common Core in homeschool curriculum? And, and they were making assumptions and guesses. You know, if this is Common Core, that's Common Core. And I am a no drama mama. <laughs> so uh, I said, we can't make assumptions here. You know, that's not fair to us and our kids. It's not fair to the companies somebody's got to start sending, you know, emails to these companies and asking, you know, and, and if they are, that's fine, because maybe somebody wants to use Common Core, but we need to find out. Um, so I, I kind of got nominated for that task. <laughs> uh, I started sending out letters and I thought, oh, there's going to be a lot of letters. I'll probably need to send like 300 letters. This will take some time. And um, nine years and over 5,300 companies later. <laughs> wow. Uh, what happened was I started a roadmap, uh, a website called the Homeschool Resource Roadmap, um, and that started out oh, as a so what? Okay, now you, yeah. we're we're unpack. We gotta yeah. okay. we, we like to unpack. So what what take us to the place where you decide to start the website? Okay, so I was sending these letters to the companies. And I, I just, I have four questions. I started asking from the beginning. I still ask them, just basically getting at if they've connected to the Common Core standards in any way. Um, and I say in the letter, it's not a judgment call. Um, I'm not gonna bash you, I'm not gonna blacklist you, but parents wanna know one way or the other. So Clarity. can you tell us, yes. right? Like they wanna know if it's a Christian or secular resource, they wanna know what ages it's for, this is another thing they wanna know. Um, and I've had a real good response from the companies with that because I, and if, if a person goes to the website, they will see that it's just a neutral listing. It's not- Absolutely. You know, it, it's not a commentary. Very, it's just a right. resource. Exactly. So, um, so I originally made a list of companies in a Facebook group, but then it got too long. <laughs> so then I made a website, and then people started saying, "Well, it's good that you've got this list, but I'm looking for elementary math, and I can't tell which companies have elementary math." And so then I expanded the website. Um, to make charts and graphs that say, okay, well, here's where the companies stand on Common Core, but here are the ones that have math. Here are the ones that have reading. Here are the ones that have science. And then, you know, here, here's their worldview perspective. But did you have a background in designing websites? No, I was on, I unschooled myself in that. <laughs> nice. Basically, yeah, I'm like, I, here's a task. How do you do it? I learned it. <laughs> did it take long to learn? Um, I mean, I think you've seen the website. I think it looks pretty okay considering I'm a nice. It does. Nice it does. So. I'm, I'm just curious. The, yeah. we're, we're, we always get down to the rudimentary because if someone yeah. has a whole amount of information and they're trying to figure out how to organize it, someone who's listening right now or watching is thinking, well, man, I've got, I've had an idea, but I'm intimidated at whatever the step is. So I'm trying to work through what, yeah. what brought you to go through that step. So you started to hear a lot of the same common feedback from parents with the lack of clarity of them knowing what, what specific resource was. And then even in the resource, not just the common core, but the specificity of how it would fit what it, hey, what, which, who has the best science? Who has the, or who has, how can I even compare them? I don't even know which one offers it and which one doesn't. They don't wanna just kind of have a one size fits all, but they wanted to get into the specifics it seems. Yeah, and what I noticed, um, and the reason I, I did what I do, and again, it's information without commentary, um, and companies have said to me, will you write a review about my product? I'm like, nope, I am, I'm kind of agnostic about it. I want everything to be out there and parents to make the decision, yeah. uh, because what I had seen was, you can do a Google search, and you'll get the top hits for the people who paid, you know, for the ad. Um, <laughs> You could look at homeschooling blogs and you will get reviews about things that people are affiliates for and they, they naturally, they like it, so they want to promote it and that's great. But you won't get a whole list of here's every single option, right? So I, and I had not seen anything like it. So I decided that my calling was to make a chart where there's every single option in every subject area. And so like, if we look at elementary math, for example, a person can go to my website and click on the link for that and see a chart. It's a PDF you can download and print out if you want, but it's really long for that subject. Um, and see every single elementary math company that I've discovered over the last nine years that markets to homeschoolers and is available to homeschoolers. Also private Christian schools and even public schools can use my site because it lists the worldview perspective as well. 
So if yeah. someone's teaching in a charter or a, a, you know, a public school, they can, they can see which ones would be appropriate um, for their curriculum uh, committee or whatever it is. Um, but my goal was just to list everything and then to give the different parameters so that parents can take the big picture and narrow it down and say, now that I've seen it all, here are the ones that might work. And I'm not missing a good possibility because I've seen them all in one place. And that to me is what was a point of differentiation of what caught my attention because I'm very into schooling, very into education. Uh, uh, and I also like the fact that you took that unbiased approach because we all know if we go to even Amazon or anywhere, right? And we see a, a perfect five-star reviews, we say, this person paid for these reviews, right? Because, exactly. you know, you know, three star, three star on the other hand, seems a little, maybe these people always have issues who hit, always hit three star. But then we see about a 4.2 or 4.5 and we start to read it and start to figure out some, we start to look for common themes. So you're right. It is clear that there's a difference of when parents can uh, go to a place where it's been curated and mm -hmm. it doesn't have commentary, but it allows for them to say, you go ahead and you assess yourself and let me know what your thoughts are. Can you tell us a little bit, have, are you familiar with either Howard Gardner, Jennifer Fox with uh, your child's strengths or Sir Ken Robinson's um, work? Uh, I've heard of Ken Robinson. I've watched a couple of his TED Talks. I think he's pretty amazing. Um, that's about the extent of my, my knowledge of him. Howard Gardner um, actually is the one who did the research on the eight great smarts yes. <laughs> back in, I don't know, the seventies or something like yeah. that, which is what my book ultimately is based off of. So yeah. the I'm kind of a, a grandchild of Howard Gardner and that oh, yes. because it wasn't direct, but. <laughs> well, no. And I love, and I love the, I love the multiple intelligence theory. Uh, it, it, it seems you made it in more practical language and, and that, that offspin of, of that, of keeping it going, but then bringing it to a way where parents can. can. So can you talk a little bit about some of the smarts, highlight a few of the smarts, and even your journey with discovering the point of differences and the distinct learning abilities of your own children? And you don't have to put them by name or on blast or anything. It's not, <laughs> to, but it's more to help parents because I that's what I enjoy about your book is I enjoyed how you open up and you talked about your own life and the discovery process and then you also I'd love to hear some of the feedback you're getting from parents who are yeah. also utilizing the resource. Sure, sure. Well, I actually learned about Howard Gardner and Thomas Armstrong is the other guy that kind of came up with those, that theory of multiple intelligences. When I was in college, um, uh, an education professor, her name is Kathy Cook. Um, she is, um, she talked about it in class and it became a thing that I knew about so that when I started raising my kids, I was aware of it and I had been friends with her for some time. She wrote the book that actually uh, is the genesis for my book. Her book is called, well, the first book was called How Am I Smart? And she wrote that maybe 10 years ago at this point. But what she did was it's a general parenting book. And what she did was take that, that theory, that psychological background of Gardner and Armstrong and bring it down to a practical level for parents. Um, but it was, it's a theoretical book in the sense of here's the big theory, here's how you can apply it in a general parenting sense. Um, and then the revision of that book is called Eight Great Smarts, which came out a few years ago. So spring of 2020, um, before everything, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, she asked me if I would write a treatment of her book just for homeschooling parents. And at the time I said, well, Kathy, you know that I have to graduate my kids. They're graduating in May. I'm still busy. I'm still engaged in that. I'm not, I, my priority is here. So I need to finish well. And we just kind of set that aside. And, um, and then I thought that was the end of it. Graduated my kids kind of moved on. And that fall she came back and she said, will you write the book now? Um, Moody wants it. And uh, if you write a couple chapters, I'll write a proposal and we'll submit it, but they want it. And my husband said, go for it we'll get the crock pot out just right. <laughs> so I did. And um, God gave me the words for two chapters in like a week, which it was not me. I have to give credit where it's due. Um, submitted it. Moody came back and said, yes, we want this. And this would have been mid-October of 2020. They said, yes, we want it. And for various reasons, we're kind of green lighting this really fast. And so your deadline is December 7th. <laughs> 
I said six <laughs> weeks to write a book and they had said it's a shorter book. And for people who don't know, it's, it, it is by design a shorter book, about 150 pages um, because homeschooling parents are really, really busy. So we don't have time to read a 300 page Absolutely. book all the time. Um, and it's little and it's um, um, for a reason. Um, and my husband said, yes, do it. We'll keep the crock pot out. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of closed myself in my office and I kept writing and I actually got enabled me to get the work done by Thanksgiving. And so then I had some people look at it and we submitted it to Moody in early December and they worked on it, had an amazing editor um, with that process. And so then the book came out in August of 2021. Um, which was a fast process because usually it takes a year for a book to go from submission to printing, but Moody, Moody uh, worked on it quickly. So um, as far as the eight great smarts or the eight smarts, uh, one thing that parents should know is that every single person on the planet has all eight. All right. So that's a cool thing. It's not, am I smart? It's that's why Kathy's original book was called, how am I smart? Oh, yeah. Because we are all smart. <laughs> um, one of the things institutional schooling has done um, when Armstrong and Gardner looked at this is they elevate two smarts, word smart and logic smart. smart yeah. And the way the schools are set up, those are the smarts that if those are your top smarts, you do really well at institutional schooling because it's set up to really, not consciously, but it is set up to really elevate those two. But if you're body smart as your big main smart, if you're picture smart, if you're music smart, you don't really fit the school mold and you're often told you have ADHD. One of my daughters is very body smart. She moved and moved and moved and moved. And yeah. if she'd been in school, someone would have said she had ADHD and I would have had to medicate her. Now you meet her, she is the most calm, placid person. She's never taken a drug for any of that. Absolutely. <laughs> right? So one of the things that is a blessing if you homeschool or, or, or I mean, some, some school teachers, really, I need to tell you this, try their, their level best to value all eight smarts. You know, they've done the research, they've read Kathy's book and they try to incorporate all eight smarts into their classrooms. Um, and so we need to credit them for that. But again, the system doesn't really allow it because they're on pressure. You've got to do the standardized test. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And they don't, they don't really have the time to do it, right? So they try, but being able to customize for your own kids, uh, if you can at all homeschool, is the easiest way to tap into all of those smarts. So let's go through the smarts uh, and just give one sentence to define it for uh, the audience. So uh, you already mentioned, one, let's start with the, you started with logic smart. So talk about logic smart and then give a sentence on what that means to a parent. So, and I'm going to have to count with my fingers to make sure I get all eight. <laughs> uh, logic smart is in a sentence. Uh, you think with questions. Those are your kids who question everything, right? So every two-year-old is very logic smart. And then <laughs> if they Absolutely. keep questioning, they're logic why, smart. Why, 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 why? Exactly. <laughs> Word smart is the other one that is emphasized in school. You think with words, you know, speaking, writing, those kind of things. Uh, body smart, you think with movement, okay? It's you think with movement. That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, we can tell, I'll tell you a story. It is in the book. I can tell the audience a story about my, my moving daughter with that. Um, music smart, you think with rhythms and melodies. So we all use our music smart. For example, when you try to spell Mississippi, I dare anybody to do it without the cadence and the rhythm. You can't, oh, <laughs> right? That's how we all <laughs> learned it. <laughs> right, if you think with music and melody and, and you know, some kids will say, for example, I think better if I can listen to music while I study, those are music smart kids, right? Other yeah. kids can't do that, it distracts them. Um, let's see, picture smart, you think with visuals, with images. Um, so another way to maybe talk about that is to say that they're right brain learners because they think with images. Um, let's see, what else? Nature smart, you think with patterns. And nature smart people love to be outside because you can see the patterns in nature and, and make sense of the world that way. Um, people smart, you think with, in the presence of other people, collaboration, talking, communication, all of that. And then self smart, you actually think deeply by yourself, right? And that's how you process. Uh, and again, we all have all eight. Um, we usually default to three or four that we are designed to actually be our go-tos. Um, but with kids, when they're little, 
it's really wise to try to activate all eight of them and just ex let kids experience things with all eight. And then as they become, you know, nine, 10 years old, you can kind of see which ones are their natural ones and you can use the natural ones to facilitate learning most easily for them. So that, I think that's brilliant. Can you give a, can you unpack a, a, as you said, a story of with your own child? I know when I watch our children, each one of them is different. We have the three and then all, uh, also I, we went to a, a friend's, we ran into some friends the other day and they asked us to come to their son's uh, basketball team. So it's like a, a select league. So we go to the select league and I'm, we're watching, my son and I are watching his team play and the, there's the, the guy who is their point guard. He moves in such a beautiful way. It was just weird to watch. So I, me I remember I asked, said, how is he turning on a dime like that? They said, oh, he takes a tap in ballet as well or whatever. And so I said, oh, because they were saying, isn't it weird? It's like beautiful to watch him move because it was just, he just was going away from the defender or moving to the, or if he, even if he's falling, the way he falls was different than the, so it was just weird. But as you talk about body smart, he had that spatial genius to know at all times where, and he's throwing these passes that are amazing. And he's the small little 12 year old or, you know, yeah. so it was just weird to watch this and to see this, this movement uh, in action of, as you talk about the different smarts. So talk a, a little bit about your, your child. Yeah, so um, so Rachel is my older. She doesn't mind me saying it. You know, she had to sign permission that I could use her in the book. Both my girls did, so that's fine. Um, she's both my kids have a high level of body smart, but Rachel especially. So she was the one that I mentioned that if she'd been in school, they would have said probably she has ADHD because she was the one who was always climbing our tree. She was the one who, when she was five years old, looked out the window at our swing set little metal swing sit with that round, you know, metal top. She said, mama, I could back balance across that if I could walk across it. <laughs> and the thing is, I knew she could, but I said, yes, you could, but you may not. <laughs> yeah, totally not. Um, and the story I tell in the book about that, where it kind of really became clear to me or was starting to become clear because she was about five years old, we were working on counting to a hundred. Um, and that was, Abby was able to just, it, Abby, by the way, one of her top smarts is logic smart. And so for her, just, all right, count to 100. She gets the pattern. She goes with it, right? Um, Rachel really couldn't. She'd sit at the table with me, and she'd get to about 10, and she'd get stuck. Wow. And then maybe the next day, she'd get to 18 or something, and she'd get stuck. And I thought, well, what's going on here? So one day, I was having her come for her, her little math lesson, and I called her into the room, and I was writing something at, on the table at the table. And so she started skipping around the kitchen table. And she was counting and she kept counting. She, I, I, and I woke up at, you know, about 50. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of sat there, didn't want to scare her, paid attention. And the girl was counting and counting and counting and counting. And she got all the way to hundred and sat down and said, Ooh, okay, I'm done. <laughs> wow. And I was kind of gobsmacked. And I said, honey, could you do that again? And she tried and she couldn't get past 10 or 12 when she was sitting still. Wow. And so I test, and I, and I knew about the eight grade smart. So this is something I could actually just in the back of my mind, I'm like, all right, what's going on here? So um, and that's the difference at that moment as a parent and an educator is how to, it's the practical of, okay, now let me sit back and let me observe because you're learning through observation now. She's right. right there and she's, something's being revealed to you about her. That's yes. a point of difference and an advantage that is may not be seen just in certain environments. Certain environments cause for things for her to feel that comfort to be able to do that. Yeah, exactly. And so after you know testing it a few days in a row, it was clear that when she moved, she could do this learning task. And when she sat still, it was a struggle. And so I was able to say, okay, I can harness that at home. Not that she should be allowed to be moving and distracting all the time, because that's the other thing. Um, we can say, well, I'm body smart. I have to move. I have to do this. I'm music smart. I have to tap my pencil all the time, you know? <laughs> no, not if it's going to distract other people, not if it's going to be a bother. So even in a classroom, if a child knows that they have body smart or music smart, um, you figure out ways. So, so one of the tricks I know um, Kathy talks about in her book is if you have a music smart child and they want to tap rhythms all the time, you teach them to tap with a pencil on their knee. 
because they're not distracting anybody else than if their legs under the desk, right? As opposed to yeah. just kind of be bopping all over the place in the classroom, you can't do that, right? And even at home. Um, so it's not an excuse for bad behavior. That's what people need to understand. But I really think a lot of the kids in the school system who are labeled as ADHD, first of all, they're just little kids and little kids are wired to move, right? Absolutely. And so I think one of the hard things in school is that we tell five, six, seven-year-olds they have to sit still for seven hours a day that's just not the way they're In the real world, they're overstimulated <laughs> all the time. I mean, information is changing so rapidly and most of their teachers are on some sort of device even during the day while they have them working. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it seems like a futile effort to have it them. It is, stay. but you know, I think, you know, to say to it, you know, you're ADHD, I, no, you're a little kid. And then if your body's smart also, that's two reasons why you just need to be moving. And it's remember body smart are. kids learn when they move. Right, so if you can find ways, um, I have heard of classroom situations where teachers are really aware of this, and maybe they have they must have administrators who are on point with it all. So they offer um, those like bouncy ball things to yep. kids who want to move, and they can just sit and, and they're just doing this little thing, but that's enough, right? And, and so the schools that are really aware of child development try to find ways to accommodate. Absolutely. So. Uh, once you discover this about your own child, what other, you know, of the other smarts really have hit you? And then what kind of common feedback have you seen from other parents about smarts that they're discovering with their own children? Because I know at this point you're getting feedback about the work because you already got feedback about the, the, you know, the resource portal that you created. Now with the, with the tool in parents' hands to almost take it out of and, you know, you know, blessings to Howard Gardner and the work and the foundation of work, yet at, uh, it can be very intimidating for a parent to sit down and th they're going to, well, I, I don't know anything about pedagogy and I don't know anything about curriculum and all, you know. So right. the way that it's in common language, which, common language in which people can digest, talk about some of the feedback you're hearing from parents about the things that they're seeing with their own children and some of the, man, these seem to be more prevalent smarts that are maybe not even that those are the children's dominant ones, but they're the ones that they find makes them the most successful because, you know, their parents and their edges, their school, you know, their, their teachers are like, oh yes, this is the way you learn. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, that was my goal was to, you know, specifically for homeschooling parents in my case, cause that's, that's my wheelhouse. But Absolutely. I know that, you know, other parents can read my book too, because, um, the whole point of my book was to say, specifically, if you're a homeschooling parent or if you care about talking into your kids with education, what are some practical tips and tools that you can do um, for your child who has this smart uh, strength or you want to shore up this other smart strength? What are some very practical tips? And so, um, you know, for example, the bouncy ball thing, you know, you can do that at home. And if you have a body smart child, one of my suggestions would be buy one of those balls at your house. Don't demand that your child sit at, at, a, at the table, at the kitchen table or at his desk or something like that. Um, my daughter spent a lot of time up in our tree in our backyard because she's also nature smart is a high one for her. So it's very interesting. I'm not very nature smart. That's probably my number eight out of all of them. And I didn't get it. But if she could go outside and she could just climb up in the tree with her book, something made a difference compared to sitting in the living room with that same book. You know, and she didn't get to go all the time. Um, no, but you created opportunities because of this difference. Yes. Yes. Uh, my other daughter, um, one of her top smarts is logic smart. And so those are the ones that think with questions. She was the one who, if you think about it a different way, was always challenging me in different ways. You know, mommy, why this? Why that? Um, and what's cool about it is that because I knew about the smarts and I knew that about her, I was able to not take it personally. And I was able to not think, yeah, oh, this child needs to be disciplined because she's asking questions. No, this was her way of learning and processing and thinking. And of course she needed to be respectful, um, but it's not a bad thing when she came and said to me, probably 13 or 14 years old, mom, why do I have to study a whole bunch of science in high school? I'm not feeling called to a science career. And <laughs> what she did was she had actually kind of written out a whole I don't know if she wrote it out, but she thought it out, a whole argument of why she shouldn't have to study in-depth college level prep science for her. I love <laughs> and it. she was logical and she Stating made sense. Yes. 
right? She wasn't being argumentative, but she had figured this all out. And I had to acknowledge that she had a lot of good points. And at one point I said to her, well, but what if you change your mind and you're a high school junior and you realize God's calling you to the medical field or something? And she said, well, either that'll be my fault, won't it? I'll either have to spend more time in high school or I'll have to buckle down for two years and really dig in, but it'll be my decision then. And, you know, I, I'm not one of these radical unschoolers where I give my kids, you know, free reign of our household or anything like that. But I, I could see her logical thought process and her questioning in a meaningful way. She really wanted to know. Um, and that was to know that is really good for relationship. Because I think a lot of times um, if a child's smart strength is not ours, we can butt heads with a kid, right? And yes. But if we know where we're coming from, where they're coming from, it actually helps relationship. And that's the bottom line with parenting, right? Is we need yes. to be in a relationship with our kids and then we can facilitate everything else. Well, and I, what I love is, can, can you go back to the time when with each of those children and then uh, also what, you, what you're hearing from um, other parents now as, as your resource is out, uh, right. what, when they, when you begin to walk them through get, getting some language about what it is that was a, an advantage for them, you get what I'm saying? So it's, oh, you know, hey, you know, this actually is a, a strength for you. You seem to really do well for that because one of the things, uh, our, our tensions is, uh, as my wife and I, is that I, I try to keep a, 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 for years, I've kept a strengths journal of different things. Now, I don't tell them everything that in it when they, and when they're at the right age, I'm going to let them have it almost as a help to just say, yeah. these are some things we've observed as your parents. But I do want to give them some language around when they say, man, I seem to do well. And I say, well, how do you feel right now? And I say, well, you know, that's called this, you know, right. can you get, can you take us back to some of those conversations and what that did for your relationship with schooling your child and how they felt? Um, it, it, <laughs> it actually helps an awful lot. Um, so I guess going back to the logic smart. So my older daughter um, was a later bloomer when it came to spelling, right? And if we think about English spelling, it makes no logical sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, and one of the things I was able to tell both I my love kids, how you highlighted that. <laughs> Go ahead. I was an English teacher. It makes no sense. Yes. Um, so, but to actually say to the child who's struggling with spelling, because Abby was a more natural speller, but Rachel was not, to be able to say, you know what? Um, you're thinking logically about how this word should be spelled. English is not logical. That actually shows the child, I'm not dumb, right? Okay, here, yes, what I'm thinking makes sense. And, and again, it empowers the child to be able to use that, that language and to say, honey, because you're using your logic smart right now, you see that that doesn't make sense. Now we still need to spell it the standard way. We can't reinvent the language, <laughs> but you know, here's why and here's how we can get at that. So that would just be one, um, I guess, simple example. But I have been hearing from other parents that, like you said, to give the children the language of what those smarts are and to explain it and to use that language in your home. Um, it really is empowering. Again, not to be an excuse. It's not like, you know, okay, I, I can ignore the whole entire family because I'm self-smart. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you can say, you know, I'm self-smart. So mom and dad, I need, I need an hour. I just need to go into my room. I need to journal because a lot of self-smart people, they journal, right? That's how they process the world. Um, I need some time rather than stomping off and slamming the door, right? So when we give our kids the vocabulary um, and, and ourselves the vocabulary, uh, and I've been hearing from all kinds of parents who never heard the terminology before, and it really is helpful um, as they apply it and think about it with their kids. So you have a child that's picture smart, and yeah. they're frustrated because currently they may have a teacher because here, I, I want to dig into some, a couple of different scenarios so that you can help some parents that are, because, you know, some parents have the uh, opportunity or they've made the opportunity to homeschool and then others still have their children in there. What would be some helpful ways that they can almost cue their teachers or provide help to their teachers of saying, hey, this is something. So you have a picture smart child and they might be bored because the classroom is not engaging them, what would be yeah. some uh, recommendations you would have for that parent to, to when they get their child one-on-one, -on -one, but then also when they go back to the classroom, because they do have those opportunities to meet with the teacher. You know, if they have a receptive teacher, 
I would talk to the teacher and I would say, you know, would you be willing to read a little bit about Gardner and Armstrong? Would you be willing to read Kathy Cook's book? I'll buy it for you. <laughs> um, you know, they, the, a classroom teacher might not respond to my book, but they might, right? Because they could see the applications for the classroom as well. You can, you can apply it across the board. It's just that, you know, my, my target audience was homeschoolers. But to go to that teacher and say, could I buy this book for you? Because I think it would really give you some good language and some helpful stuff. And then maybe something simple like that, just to say, you know, I know that my son is picture smart because, you know, when we're, when we're at church, he doodles during the sermon. And I know that it helps him to understand because we talk about it after. And so I've learned that he learns by doodling. So if you see him doodling, you know, on a scrap piece of paper during your lecture, don't assume he's not paying attention. You know, so you can, you can give teachers really practical insight into the things that you've observed so that, because I think a lot of times, you know, they're, they're overwrought. Teachers are overwrought and they're overstressed. And, and I think sometimes they just are like, okay, children all fit into the box because I'm stressed here. But if you can give them a tool and you can say, I know that you need respect. I can tell you that this child doing this thing is not disrespectful because he's picture smart. I think that can help teachers relax. That was right. that right there is massively true. I I my I had a passive instruction, and when I was teaching, I would be frustrated because there would be some people that were always drawing, and I'm thinking, and then they'd say, "Oh no, Mr. Benjamin, look at my notes," and they'd show, and they'd have these really extensive notes. But at the time, as you're instructing, it looks like they're goofing off and they're not paying attention. They're not making eye contact. They're not really connecting. They're not really contributing anything to the discussion. But if I ask them a question, like I think I'm catching them off guard. And then they say, oh, you said this, this, and this, and this. And I, they remind me of something that I didn't even remember saying. And it's like, because they were taking detail that that action of doing pictures brought something alive in them. So I, I love that. What what would you say to parents who don't feel qualified? That is a conversation that I've had with many parents is they don't feel qualified with all the, we're, we're in the information age and overload. And so because of people feeling that, it, you know, I, I heard parents talk about the frustrations when everything went remote um, because they say, of course, with their own schedule and their job and everything, everything was kind of thrust upon everyone with the modifications that the planet went through. And you know, I don't know if people <laughs> watch or listen to this, but the global modification that everybody went through, it's an overplayed word that I'm not going to say. But right. <laughs> with that being the case, when when they ha- when all those adjustments were made, they would say, man, I just feel so, I, I just realized I'm not, I'm not qualified to do this. I can't. And, and I don't believe that. I would tell them, I'd say, no, it's hard. It's work for all of us, but maybe it's, we're trying to, you know, you know, fit fit a, a, a square peg into a circle, you know, because we're yeah. trying to do it based upon somebody else's playbook. Take this playbook and make this work. So can you speak to parents who feel inadequate and inept at really drawing out greatness out of their children? Yep. So the distance learning that, that everybody had to endure two years ago um, is not homeschooling, right? So first of all, homeschooling doesn't take eight hours a day. No. So because you're doing one-on-one, or even if you have a few children and you group them together for some things, it still just takes maybe for the child at a high school level, three to four hours a day. And at a high school level, a lot of that is self-directed, right? For a little kid, an hour, two hours a day. And some of it is they're doing it on their own after you've instructed them. And it's just a little bit of your time, right? So that's something that parents need to understand. Distance learning is not homeschooling. Homeschooling, you don't have to imitate the school. You know, in fact, it's harder if you imitate the school. I had to undo my school thinking when I decided to homeschool my kids because I had that mentality. First period, second period. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, here's the bell, here's recess. No, 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 no. Most, in fact, every that I know of state homeschool law really gives parents the right and responsibility to set a schedule that works for your kids, right? So I talked to working parents Um, about how do I homeschool? There's a lot of different ways to do it. I've even talked to single working parents who want to homeschool and they do. Because one thing you learn is it doesn't have to happen 9 to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, 180 days a year. It can happen, you know, if if you work, okay, fine. If you work daytime hours, you can do your academic stuff during the evening because it only takes a little bit of time. And then I think the trickiest thing 
is maybe finding childcare during the day. You know, yeah. if, if you're, you can do the academics on the weekend and at night, but you do need to find if your children aren't old enough to stay home by themselves, a place where they can be, right? But what if the, and, what if the parent's working remotely now and yeah. the child is there, but they don't have, but, but they might have pockets. Can you break yeah. down a couple of practical, you know, just sample schedules so that parents can see this is some of the ways you did it and also some of the ways you heard that other parents did it that worked. And then some of the supplementary things you did to maybe take them to expose them to opportunities that maybe, you know, talk about the advantages that might be there for the parent that is attempting to homeschool or, you know, like you said, they worked that full-time job and whatnot. And, or um, even when they come home and their parent, the, the child is going to the traditional classroom but they may not be getting the maximum opportunity. No disrespect to the teachers doing their thing, but they might, the child still might feel frustrated about it. How can the parent then do a couple of things, you know, just give a couple of sample schedules and, and things that you found? Okay. Um, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> I know. I uh, at least five questions. I wanted right, to Right, right. All right. So let's take one. a look here who's, who's working remotely. Um, you, you might be able to talk to your boss and say, okay, because my husband actually, he's kind of on a hybrid schedule right now. So our kids are graduated, but, but let's say it was during the time when they're here, he's hybrid. So he works from home Monday, Friday, and he has to go to the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's kind of what his schedule is. So let's say there's somebody like that, right? But so many, especially now, because it's so hard to find workers and good workers, yes. um, employees kind of have a leg up. And if you talk to your supervisor and you say, you know what, I need to log in to work at nine o'clock every day because my kids are homeschooled now. And between eight and nine, I'm going to set them up and get them going for the morning on their learning tasks. I can't get them up too early because they're going to be sleeping anyway. <laughs> you know, most bosses are going to say, okay, let's rejigger your schedule and adjust your schedule. And you can do that. Um, and if you don't, well, then you can set them up with their learning tasks the night before, right? Um, and, and teach them self-regulation and get them going. And then when you get your coffee break, you go and you check on what they're doing. One thing people don't often know, again, distance learning is not homeschooling. Yes. Homeschooling does not have to be online, right? It can be. There are online programs where a child can be doing all of their academics with a homeschool program online, which is not the same as distance learning. There are some where you could maybe do a math online and sciences with a book or experiments. It can be all offline and the child can, you know, you have this curriculum and it says the child does this, 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 and this. Well, you can set them up with that the night before, in the morning, and have them do a few things and then come back and check and have these conversations with them through the day. Um, one of the tools I used with my girls, I did not create it. A woman named Sue Patrick created it. It's called the Workbox system. And I think it's brilliant. Um, basically, it's you get a, a shoe rack and you get a set of plastic shoe boxes um, and you set them up and you put learning tasks in each box. About 12 shoe boxes fit on a, sh a typical shoe rack. And you just put whatever you want. And for my case, some of them said work with mom. So history was together with my girls. That was the first box of the day and it was a work with mom box. And we came to the kitchen uh, and or the living room and we did our history. But box two was, Rachel's gonna go and do something. She's gonna do her, her copy work and her narration from our history lesson by herself while I work with Abby on her math, right? So Abby's box two was work with mom on math while Rachel had an independent task. And I think you can adjust that kind of a system for if you're working from home and your children are being homeschooled. You know, you, you set up these visible concrete system for your kids to follow. So it's not something they have to remember, but it's right in front of their faces, you know, and they can, all right, I'm going to take that box down. I've got it done. Now it's off the rack. Look at the progress I made. All the boxes yeah. are off. Yeah. That was one of my girl's best things when the boxes were done for the day. <laughs> what a great visual illustration. There's uh as I talked about comic books earlier, I love how you um, talked about having them engage in copy work in your book of um, just to increase their writing and their vocabulary. They can also notice patterns. They can just also discover their own voice as they're writing other people's words. I love that. Uh, one of the, uh, the great comic books that are, you know, was really big at the time I was growing up was called the X-Men and the main guy had a school for gifted youngsters who are all different. They all have these differences that in a regular setting would 
make them an outcast because they don't fit in a traditional class. But he's trying to help them to steer on how to learn. Okay, this is too powerful for that setting. Bring that in. This yeah. you can work with. It. So he's creating this um, place where it's. I think that always uh, grabbed my attention as a child because I didn't do well in the traditional school setting, and there were a lot of mislabels and whatnot. Um, and those, and there were only a few teachers that recognized my learning advantages, and they call it out. And I say, "Oh wow, I've never heard this before." So that made me go and and then start to you know break off some of those labels. So. Here's one of the things I wanted to ask you is that, can you speak to parents um, about the importance that you had? I, I love how you talk about some of the challenge points with your children. And I wanted to make sure to not give everything away in the book. That's why I'm specifically- <laughs> Right, you want them to buy it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We will need them to go buy the book. But um, talk, talk about the role that talking to the, the Heavenly Father has in unlocking some of these things about your children. Because for me, I definitely believe there's a difference between schooling versus education. I look at schooling as the you know, administering of a curriculum. And, you know, they, if you look at the definition, it talks about taking place in a building. It's, this, it's a system. And whereas education comes from the root word educe, which means to draw out or to call forth. And I think that the viewpoint of uh, what we can see with the conventional school system is that it is based upon these empty vessels that need to be filled. Whereas if you look at um, more of a um, biblical, scriptural perspective of humanity, it talks about the heart of a person is deep waters and the person of understanding draws it out. You know, eternity being said in our hearts, like there's these, all these beautiful, this beautiful imagery, even talking about a garden and, you know, our life being parallel to this area that just needs cultivation in the right environment. So can you speak to that some of, uh, you know, maybe a point when you were frustrated, which could be every day for a lot of parents, <laughs> <laughs> but then you got a, you got an insight from the father and it helped you to go forward with a little more confidence. Yep. All right. So I'll tell the story we talked about before we started taping of my younger daughter, the logic smart one, right? Oh. <laughs> um, when, so I started teaching my older daughter to read when she was five, because I was still in that school mentality of, oh, she's five, she has to learn to read. I have since learned, and I encourage parents, you know what, the normal range for learning to read actually extends to age 10, right? Doesn't mean your child has a disability. The schools push it at five or six, because in the system, they need all the children to be doing the same things at the same time. You can't manage a classroom like that otherwise, right? The problem is kids aren't naturally wired to all learn at the same time. But at the time I was like, all right, Rachel's five, got to pull up the reading book. And I was dutifully working with her on that. And Abby was 11 and a half months younger. And I'm like, she's really bright. She's on the ball. I'm going to start with her too. She's four years old. <laughs> she's capable. So I sit her down with the curriculum and she's picking up the concepts. She's blending. She's got all of this. But every time I pulled out the curriculum and sat her down at the table, just for reading, penmanship, math, she was fine with. She had a meltdown, a temper tantrum. And this was a very calm child. It's like, what is going on with her? And um, so, <laughs> you know, and it was out of character, right? She, she wasn't a strong-willed kid as far as, as exerting that but just with reading and so I started thankfully I remember to start praying right so all right, yes. like, what is going on with this because on the one hand I knew she's four years old even if my five-year-old has to learn to read which again I don't believe anymore the four-year-old doesn't but I don't want her to think that her temper tantrum is getting her her way because that's the mm. last thing we want right so Lord, what should I do I could put it aside but I don't want to send her the wrong message and I just I prayed that for a few weeks and uh, still kept trying, still kept getting the temper tantrum. <laughs> and then one day I pulled out the stuff. I said, Abby, come on over to the table. And she crossed her little arms and she stomped her little foot. And she said, mama, I just want to be four. Let's go. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> I had the wherewithal. The Lord said, the spirit said, you know what? That's my answer. Yes. In this case, you're not facilitating a temper tantrum. I've been trying to communicate with you through this logic smart child <laughs> that yes. it's illogical to make her do this. And, and so I, with much trepidation, I said, okay, we're going to set it aside. Um, said, honey, when you turn five, um, we're going to try again, unless you tell me that you're ready. And the thing for her is 
what I've learned now is she was cognitively ready before, but she wasn't emotionally ready. I don't know why she it. just wasn't, you know? Um, and it was about two or three weeks before she turned five. She literally came up to me in her little four-year-old self-assured sense. And she said, mama, I'm ready now. Wow. So I pulled that out again. I was like, are we going to have another tantrum today? I pulled out the stuff and it was bliss. <laughs> she was emotionally ready. She was cognitively ready. And she was a reader within days, right? Wow. By the time she was seven, she was reading books written for 11 year olds. And it was just her thing. Um, if I had kept pushing, 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 because I'm the mom, yeah. I, our, our relationship would have been damaged. She would have hated reading, even though she could have done it. Um, but I would not have gotten that wisdom on my own, right? I, I think in, you know, in the throes of parenting, we get so busy, we get so stressed, we can forget that we need to set, spend time and take the time first thing every day, whatever it is before we go to bed to really be in prayer. Yes. Because if we're not, we're going to miss the forest for the trees in our own fallen wisdom. <laughs> well, this is true. We had, thank you for sharing that. We have one, as we're wrapping up, we had one of our children um, they really love animals. Uh, actually, two of them do really a lot. And the other one is just her, her, her own individual, which is hilarious. <laughs> but the two of them- There's always people, one. <laughs> there's always one, right? So they they both love animals really well. But one child in particular was has has loved the Dr. Doolittle, the original ones, the, you know, the real thick ones, just dives into them and just knows all these things about animals naturally. So it's probably nature smart, right? That's probably- I would say smart. so, yeah. yeah. Because they're just highly motivated by just telling me all, tells us all kinds of things. And we'll get angry if I don't buy one of those National Geographic books. I said, in my mind, because you think about your preferences, I'm saying, you're not going to sit and read this book and care about this book, but gets mad about it, says, I'll get my own money then. And then I get, they get it, I get it for them. And within days- they're recalling all this stuff. They've read through the whole thing and they're telling me, oh, you know. So anyway, there was a, a, a book that was also about, uh, so it's a, they, I have, this is the one I'm working with in homeschool. So it's a literature-based curriculum. And mm -hmm. uh, I realized that some of the books that they had were not as, that's why I love how you pointed out, you know, it's, it, it is, you do you put in what works for you and you take out what doesn't work for you. There's no connection of you have to read not, you know, fiction writing and have to write poetry and, you know, all this, you know, creative writing skill is, is a must for you to be a well-rounded that that is again, the square peg going into yeah. the circle. But the uh, there was a book that I, I, I put in a lot of memoirs and biographies because I want them to read people from the time frame rather than them just reading about wars as a prompt to know about a time frame. It just seemed weird to me that it was, oh, what is this general and what, what, how, is, but when it was story, when it was connected to a story, so he's reading about the world's smartest horse, which I had never heard of. And, and this guy was like a real life Dr. Doolittle. They came from the World's Fair. The, it's the fascinating story about the uh, beautiful Jim Key, uh, this, this horse, this, and this man trained this horse. The horse was able to go pick up the letters and spell words. The horse was able to cite, you know, scripture through spelling it on the, it was just this crazy thing of, I never had heard before, but he's telling me about it. And he's telling me about the time frame unconsciously as, as my child talks to me about, he said, oh yes. And this is uh, the late 1800s and this was going on. And then there was this and, and, and most of their friends were going through. And I'm like, this is to me, a more meaningful connection to history than it would be if I were to just sit down and say, now tell me about who was, <laughs> you know, this, right. what and happened in Virginia on. <laughs> yeah. Or here, take this test. I mean, honestly, really? <laughs> so I love the, I love the permission that's granted in the uh, tool that you've created for parents to, to help them go forward. I mean, consistent resource. And can you now point them, uh, talk to our uh uh, our audience about uh, some of the things you're working on currently, or is there more work? What can they expect from from you on this? Uh, what is there? Is there more to come out of this work, or are you working on something else in the kitchen as well? My husband has said, "When's the next book coming out?" So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. If um, I do have an idea, um, it probably 
working title, uh, tips and tricks to homeschool, um, like for low cost or no cost, because yes. I know that's an issue. So it'd be more practical tips. Um, and that's, you know, the idea that I've got floating around. Um, and I'm always working on the roadmap. So I'm yes. always adding and editing so that when you go there, it should be up to date. Um, and because that's just an ongoing thing. Um, and then about a year ago, a local friend and I opened up a homeschool parent resource center in my community. Um, but we also have a podcast through that. So we reach kind of beyond our community. And um, that's been really fun to, to, in my community, talk to people who want to homeschool but feel stuck. You know, what is yeah. it in their situation that we can help them with? Um, and then the podcast has just been a neat way to do outreach. Um, and one of the things that goes along with that, she and I are both saying to other veteran homeschoolers, you know, maybe, maybe you homeschooled all the way through, your kids are almost done or they're done, become a mentor. Don't yes. just be done and go on because now we have time, right? Yes. Now, when my yes. grandbaby gets born, I don't know if I'll have time because yes. my time's going to go there. But right now I have time, right? So I was poured into by people who were mentors and veterans when I was young. And so my calling, and Jenny uh, is my colleague at the Homeschool Loft, which is the center we have, our calling is to now pour into other parents. I love it. And you don't have to have a center. I mean, we, we happen to have this little space. Um, you can, I was doing it in coffee shops, just meeting one-on-one -on -one with people before we opened this up. And you can, if you're, if you have one year experience as a homeschooler, you're that much more experienced than the new person, right? Yeah. So, so don't just, you know, focus on your family. Your, your kids are your priority. That's your ministry. That's your calling. Yes. But you have some time where you can, you know, incrementally pour in to other people. I, I told some of uh, the parents who I knew that were longtime homeschoolers when everything went to distance learning and then parents were trying to figure out what to do for the fall and yeah. said, you know, maybe because that some of them weren't satisfied with what they saw with the distance, it kind of put a sour taste in their mouth. So they say, you know what, I'll just do it myself. And so yeah. I, I was telling the parents who I knew that were at raised avid homeschool. I said, this is your shining moment <laughs> to be able to because people are looking for an answer right now. And this is when you can emerge and you can, you know, a group of you can come forth. And I, I love that word mentoring because people right now are still, I don't believe the dust has settled from all the changes that are going on. So just creating the option. And I love that the resource. So can you t talk about where people can find you? How can they find you? How can they find your work? And, and how can they get a hold of, where can they purchase uh, they can go to Amazon for that or, or okay. Barnes and Noble or you found it in Barnes and Noble, I think, right? You said? Yes, yes ma'am. Yep. yep. Uh, it's on Christian book distributors. So pretty much any place books are sold, I think you can find the book. Um, my website, which I have a link to the book there as well, is called the Homeschool Resource Roadmap, uh, uh, homeschoolroadmap.org. Um, and then my, my podcast is on our website. Uh, you can reach it out of there. It's called the homeschool loft. So that is homeschoolloft.com. And we have a link to our podcast episodes there. If they, if they want to hear, we have endeavored to interview a whole bunch of really neat veteran experienced homeschool people. So we've nice. got about 50 episodes out already. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's not my wisdom. It's just, we've been able to tap in and to other people's wisdom. So. What and what for for uh, any of the audience? Are there any? Um, do you have any uh, people that have really inspired you in this work that are have really inspired you? You want to shout out any of the ones that have inspired you in either parenting, homeschooling, or just education in general, where they've helped pull out some things that have really been insightful to you? Huh. All right. Quick shout out. <laughs> Um, if you're thinking about homeschooling, but you need, you feel like you need some motivation. Um, to know about the history of public schooling to kind of get you going there. Like you, you see something's not right, but you're not sure. Read anything by John Taylor Gatto. G-A-T-T-O. I just thought that name as soon as you keep going. I love the name you thought. Right. But you know what? He was a public school teacher and he yeah. decided to do the research into where the system came from. Again, it's not about teachers. It's about the system. And yeah. He's like, this is a psychotic system. It's not teachers, it's the system. Yes. But I didn't know about it until I was out of the system. And his work is great. He's, he's gone to be with the Lord. So, you know, he's not around anymore, but his work is. Um, the very first parenting slash homeschooling book I read was um, For the Children's Sake by Susan Schaefer Macaulay. She's the daughter of Francis Schaefer, who um, it was a really key apologist in the 60s and 70s. Oh, yeah. um, that's just a sweet book. Um, 
The Joy of Relationship Homeschooling by Karen Campbell. That is also a really, really wonderful one. And um, a recent one that we interviewed her, two recent ones, we interviewed these people on our podcast, A Homeschool Bravely by Jamie Erickson. Okay. Um, if you're like, I don't want to do this, but I think I should, but I don't want to, and I'm scared, read her book. <laughs> yes. And then um, another new one, The Four Hour School Day by Dorinda Wilson. Um, and she's a veteran homeschool mama, and she has written lots of books, but that's her most recent one. And it'll kind of show you how homeschooling can be so efficient that, yes, you want to be excellent and pour into your kids and not shirk your responsibility, but it doesn't have to take all day, every day, and a lot of tips and tricks for that. So I love it. Uh, what oh, As we're uh, wrapping up, what would you say, because uh, the purpose of our podcast and our show is to help people bring a return on the, their in, on the investment of their creator. We want people in, in every area that's business, that is life, that's finance and parenting, marriage and whatever walk of life people find themselves in. We believe in that. What, what can you, can you say in your own words, what you believe making your child a CEO of their own destiny means? Mm. Like you said, children are not vessels to be poured into, you know, with other things. They've got their God-given strengths, abilities, purpose, calling in life. Our job as a parent is to, first of all, we have to understand that God gave us our kids because he trusts us and he believes in us and he expects us to pull that out, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the confidence of the father that he gave us our kids for a reason. <laughs> um, so our responsibility is to draw that out, like you said, to light that fire, to help them to see what their calling is. And it's a supreme responsibility. It's also a supreme joy. Yes. Think about what a blessing that is that we get to do that and try to think positively about that, even though there are hard moments, because my kids are adults now. The days are long, but the years are few. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Tina. Uh, any last things you want to say to our audience as we're closing out? Um, no, I just think love on your kids and, and just take them as the blessing they are, even in the hard moments. Eight great smarts for homeschoolers. Tina Hollenbeck, this is a great interview. Get this resource, check out her website, get more information. You can, for all things Tina, you can go to, is it the homeschool resource map? Homeschool resource roadmap. H homeschool resource roadmap dot homeschoolroadmap.org is okay, the Okay, homeschoolroadmap.org. I want to make sure it's good. It's going to be put on the screen and all that, but homeschoolroadmap.org for all things Tina. Follow her on. Go check out the podcast. Give some feedback. Get engaged in the conversation. Get active. We want people to be mobilized, to be able to strategically have impact in their family's life. We want to see families flourish. So thank you for your time and may God bless you in your journey. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do us a favor. If this was useful in any way for you, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews will allow others to easily discover the podcast. If you'd like more information and to receive a free download, rediscover your destiny, go to ceoofdestiny.com. Thanks again and tune in next time.